Hey everyone, welcome to ESIP. Um, so this is the Human Atlas of Earth Science Information, a use case for federated knowledge graph session. Um, we have uh, several speakers. Um, the goal of this session is to review the current state and future of ESIP's usage-based discovery tool. And that plays into uh, putting forward a use case for linking and federating knowledge graphs together. Um, from that perspective, we'll be looking at an overview of Jezdis' work on graph-based search engines from Armin, uh, Jezdis' citation repository from Irina, um, some work on post citations from Bob Downs at CDAC, and finally, um, based on those uh, use cases, um, I'm going to put a, a present a talk on laying a foundation for attempting to solve the federated knowledge graph problem. Uh, but first, we're going to kick off with uh, uh, Vinny Verso from uh, NASA. What's up? We all good? Thank you. So Vinny from uh, ESDIS is going to talk about his work on uh, ESIP's usage best discovery tool. Uh, where are you at, Vinny? Step on up. There you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me OK? Great. So my name is Vincent Inverso, and today I'm going to talk about usage-based discovery and graph federation. So usage-based discovery is a novel data set discovery web application that the discovery cluster has been working on for the past few years. And as a user of this application, we're first presented with this screen that you see here. And it's a list of high level earth science research topics. So let's pretend for a moment that I am a floods researcher and I'm interested in floods. So I'm going to go ahead and click that floods topic. And actually, you can't see it, but it's kind of hiding behind um, that zoom, uh, the zoom icons there. But use your imagination. Um, so after I click on that topic, I'm presented with this screen. And on the left hand side there, you're going to see a list of research articles. And these are all research articles that fall under the topic of floods. And what I can do then is further narrow down that list of research articles into my specific research niche. So once I've done that, the really cool thing about usage based discovery is I can see all of the data sets that were referenced in each of those research articles. So that's kind of the heart of this search and discovery paradigm is we're not asking you to filter through a bunch of facets or come up with the perfect keyword terms in your query. We're saying, how are you using the data? And from that, we can tell you what data sets you, sh you should be using or you might be interested in using. And this is especially um, nice for novices who might not know how to navigate a more complicated search interface. So this application is powered by a graph database, and it's a fairly simple graph database with three different entities. We have topics, articles, and data sets. And populating this graph is very much a community effort. It's a very um, intensive effort that involves a lot of different communities. Um, obviously, the ESIP discovery cluster, um, a number of distributed active archive data centers across the US. Um, and also the usage-based discovery team. But we're not the only graph effort within NASA. I did a quick Google search and I came up with more uh, graph efforts that I could possibly list on this slide. So I'm willing to bet there are hundreds of more efforts within NASA, within ESIP, and within other organizations like NASA. So logical question that follows from that is could the UBD graph benefit from linking or federating with other knowledge graphs. 
So I've come up with some use cases here, and the first one is a little bit more high level, and, and that is what we could do is decentralize the collection and maintenance of the graph. So if we were able to federate with other graphs, the usage-based discovery graph wouldn't have to slurp up all of the world's information and just become this giant monolith of a graph um, database. We could rely on other graphs. So what this means is that each graph would become smaller. Um, the jobs of the people maintaining those individual graphs would become a lot smaller and more efficient. And we, um, as data experts, could focus on what we know and our, our niche of knowledge and benefit from one another. Um, and here's some more specific use cases. So the first one is we could connect UBD with um, a social slash researcher graph. So if I'm a user using usage-based discovery and I find a research article that I'm really interested in, um, I might need a little more information. I might want to contact the person that um, that made that article or some of the people involved or even see how am I related to some of the people that are involved in that research and better understand the community surrounding that research. Uh, we could connect to a tools graph. So sometimes it's not enough just to point a user to the data. We might also want to tell them, hey, here's some data sets, but here are also the tools that are really good for working with that data. We could connect to a code repository graph. Um, and this would be really nice because sometimes a uh, research paper is a little bit more opaque than you would like and you really want to understand how did they do this? What was the code? What were the algorithms that they actually used? So linking directly to some code repositories could be a really nice feature. And finally, we might want to augment usage-based discovery with an applications graph. Um, I mentioned in an earlier slide that we're currently focused on research articles. But there are also countless numbers of applications out there that are using data sets and we're currently not um, as, a, as a team we're not as good at finding those instances of data usage, but I bet there is a graph out there or a team out there that does collect this information if we and if we could federate with them that could be really beneficial for for our web application and perhaps for them as well. Um, so those were just some use cases. I hope that gave you a good idea of uh, usage based discovery and also how federation plays into that. Um, and thank you to everyone involved with this. Um, and if you have any questions, there's my email. Thanks. Any questions for Vinny? Any questions in general? Come back up. You weren't expecting questions, were you? Yeah. <laughs> you have time. I didn't think it was that interesting. Well, you were wrong. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, here's my question. Sure. Uh, how do I use the microphone? So, the, the best known examples of knowledge graphs having been implemented uh, are you know, the IOT, you know, the Internet of Things, your Alexas and Googles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But they still sort of remain single company curated databases. So how do you account for the fact that none of the none of these are distributed yet, you know, so uh, they're not decentralized. Uh, what, what I'm getting at is the whole uh, that the vision of the semantic web is still not there yet. So I'm wondering um, how this kind of impacts what you're, you're trying to do. Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. And I was hoping we could talk about that a little bit. Um, I mean, I'll just, I'll give you my opinion. I mean, I, I think that's a huge problem, right? There, there are these silos within a company and um, that does prevent us from fully leveraging each other's information, but, um, I think what we're seeing right now, at least the research that I've done and the federation efforts that are going on right now, um, they are building the framework and the groundwork for the technology of, of how the federation will actually happen. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, once sort of that low hanging fruit of developing the federation within a single company or organization is well developed, that um, that'll sort of provide some energy for people to say, hey, um, your data is really great. I would love to link into that. And we have the technology to do that. Um, that that's just 
how I feel about it, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Tyler Stevens, and I'm with uh, NASA and uh, uh, the Common Mended Repository. Um, I had a question because you talked about the usage-based discovery, which is is you know obviously a little bit different than the more tr traditional keyword facet search. Um, have Have you seen or done any usability studies to see if that usage-based discovery is 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 beneficial to users? Has it has it helped users? Get to what they need uh, better or faster. Um, I'm just curious about if you've looked into that. Yeah. Um, so so far, we haven't done a ton of usability studies. We don't really have like a usability expert within our team. Um, that's something though that we would definitely like to do, and something that I think is important, right? If we're saying part of our thesis for developing this is that it is an easier way for novices to discover data, and I think. We definitely need more data um, to back that. So thanks for bringing that up. Thanks. Can people online ask questions? Hey, Vincent, can people on, on, online ask a question? Yes. yes. Yep, yep. Uh, this is Ted Haberman uh, from Metadata Game Changers. Thank you for that talk. Um, uh, the, you know, the largest, um, the largest, largest graphs that, are, that exist in the research community right now is probably uh, the PID graph that's been created and maintained by uh, Datacite and Crossref and ORCID and ROAR and others. Um, I'm wondering how your effort uh, either integrates with that graph or builds on that graph or what is, are there connections between what you're doing and, and that large uh, international effort? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name of that graph. What was that? It's called, it's generally called the PID graph by uh, Crossref and Datasite and uh, ORCID and ROAR and others. Um, so, uh, we have, we have not leveraged that. I, I think some of our other, um, people within the cluster have leveraged, um, data site efforts and similar efforts a lot more than we have, but, um, it is related very much so in the sense that, um, our graph relies on, um, the digital object identifiers of the research articles and of the data sets. So, um, there is uh, that commonality and, and that would provide um, an interface uh, it to linking into that graph if we needed to um, leverage that information. Have you guys thought about um, adding the relationships that you're discovering into those graphs so that they're available in sort of the global, uh, the global picture? We have not uh, we have not thought of that, but I think um, uh, as the graph grows and as we create more value within that graph, I think that'd be a great thing to look into. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Jonathan Blythe. I um, I'm part of the cluster, and I think the the questions we're asking are uh, once you've created uh, these um, capabilities to share citation information how do you use it so we're we're at asking the next question and uh, so i think we probably should move on to the next speaker thank thanks for all the interest Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Armin Moravian. I'm a data scientist at uh, JustList, one of the NASA DAX data active archive centers. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about one of the uh, graph use cases in, in uh, within our you know, organization.
And uh, that's a combination of 12, 12 of my favorite, you know, topics like graphs and, uh, and language models. And uh, so from, from a DAC perspective or from any, you know, data provider, if you have a uh, search interface, you know, in front of your data, you always want to provide the most relevant data to your users. And uh, what I'm showing right now is, is our uh, current search stack. And uh, if you're, you know, uh, have a search engine, you probably have something similar, you know, a document store or, you know, any, uh, maybe a, even a relational database. But the bottom line is that you store these documents in a document store and then uh, there's a metadata associated with, the, with, with, with uh, your data sets. And, uh, and for example, here in this case, Elasticsearch the way it works is it tries to, you know, uh, find the exact matches for, for the keywords and then uh, the ranking is based on some sort of score uh, for Elasticsearch is this uh, practical scoring function. But more or less, you know, all of these are kind of, you know, based on the frequency of, of the query within the metadata. Uh, this is our, you know, uh, our search engine uh, looking uh, for, for data, for a search query of landslide, and our search uh, just returns one data set. And you can imagine, we, uh, we have, I guess, you know, more than 1,500 data sets, but just because uh, one of the data sets, it's tagged with, uh, with landslide, it's, it's been returned. Uh, this, uh, this is one of, you know, our, you know, first steps towards, you know, having a knowledge graph and, and, uh, and we created basically a knowledge graph of the metadata. So, uh, the nodes that, that you see data set platform instrument keyword level, they're all just, uh, coming from the data, uh, metadata. And then we added the publications that cite our data sets to this graph. And we also added the publications that cite those publications to this graph. And, uh, uh, and this is really interesting because uh, uh, for a keyword like landslide that we just got like one data set back from, from our uh, current search. Now, with a simple, you know, uh, this is a cipher query uh, for Neo4j, you can uh, immediately see that, okay, we can find that particular keyword in the abstract of the uh, publications we index in this graph and, and uh, which are the green nodes and they lead us into uh, the data sets. Now, uh, let's, you know, uh, look at the more complicated, you know, uh, uh, query, something like Algal Bloom. Uh, there is no publication within our repository that has uh, the term Algal Bloom in the abstract, so uh, uh, we couldn't find any data set attached to it. But again, uh, this is a citation network, so you can easily, you know, add more publications, the publications to, to uh, the publication that cite our data. Again, simple, you know, cipher query, and uh, uh, you see, we can now tell uh, Neo4j, go and find uh, citations that are being within two hops of our data sets. Now, immediately, uh, we can actually, you know, find a data set that, find a publication that finds another publication that is connected to the data set. Uh, it's a kind of, you know, weaker signal for relevancy, but uh, immediately, uh, we get, you know, more uh, return results. So, up until this point, what I talked about was just uh, 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 the graph and, and, and matching the keyword with, with the, with the uh, words uh, that exist in the abstract of the publications. So uh, for those of you who, I mean, uh, you are in uh, the uh, natural language processing field, you may be familiar with the language embeddings, uh, but if you're not, basically, uh, this is a very neat idea that uh, maps, you know, any uh, language component, uh, uh, it can be a phrase, it can be a word, a uh, soft word, into this, you know, high dimensional space. And the way that, I mean, it's done usually is through some sort of, you know, uh, 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 like mask language model, different methods, transformers. But what it's done is that you push a huge corpus of text to these models and, and force them to learn something about the text. For example, what, what is the next sentence or what is this keyword? And through that, you learn all these representations. You can now you know, map your data uh, to this high dimensional space. And the idea is that the, the data, the, the, the entities that are closer in the language space are also are gonna sit closer in the vector space. I'm just showing a three dimensional space. Uh, these are usually in a much higher space, uh, higher dimensional, like 300. And you can imagine how much information real estate you have when you move uh, to these high uh, dimensional uh, spaces. 
Uh, similarly, you can do this for uh, publications. You can map them to this high dimensional spaces. And then your metadata also you know, can be mapped into this space. And you can pick any of your favorite language models, you know, uh, uh, transformers, contextually, you know, any of those and, and use it. Uh, and even you know, fine tune it for your use case. Uh, now, for the search purpose, uh, if you have all your uh, data, uh, meaning that the metadata, the publication, uh, and anything that you want to add to this graph, you, when you map it in the space, uh, when a user query comes in, that query also can be placed in the space. And for example, here we have a query like uh, tropical rainfall. And, uh, and what happens is that, is that uh, when you place this query into, search, into the space, now you can uh, look up a radius of, uh, of, you can define a radius that uh, returns to you, you know, whatever you know, uh, falls within this radius, and you get some candidates back. Now, the advantage of you know, graph uh, vector indexes, I don't know if you ever, uh, these are emerging technologies. So graph uh, vector search uh, engines, they're basically the traditional document stores, but they index data uh, as, a, as a vector. So your search is actually is done in this you know, vector space. And uh, there are all types of you know, optimizations around it that uh, it makes it faster actually to, to search this space. A lot of them work on, uh, based on some ANNs, approximate nearest neighbors, and they're you know, pretty fast in terms of you know, latency. So if you really want to use this you know, at, the, at your uh, uh, enterprise or you, know, you are under you know, some certain uh, 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 response time, it's, it's, uh, this is really uh, quick. And uh, one of my personal favorite tools in this space is is this uh, vector search engine called VV8? Because uh, VV8 allows you to define a graph on top of the uh, on top of this vector space. So uh, in VV8, you can, uh, in our case, for example, we map the data uh, using our model to the space, and we can say, okay, this is a publication, this is a data set. Uh, now, when a query comes in, what VV8 does or a vector search engine does, uh, it finds some candidates. Uh, can be publications, can be data sets directly. So uh, if it's a publication, you can traverse the graph and, and get to the publication. The advantage here is that because we're using this you know, language models, now we're not exact matching you know, the hard matching the query with the, with, the, with, with the metadata or the publications. Now we can basically uh, run much, much more complicated uh, uh, queries. For example, uh, the query here is rainfall and cloud type relationship. Uh, I couldn't find any hits back and any data sets back from uh, uh, or, or publications from uh, the graph itself or from the Elasticsearch. But what you can do here, basically, you can just say, "Okay, go explore this this space." And uh, in this case, it's returning for me two results. Uh, what are the contents of the, those results? These are the abstracts of the two, you know, top results returned from uh, from uh, from uh, from the vector search. And if you look at the uh, the text uh, you're talking about, the text is talking about the relationship between you know the thickness of the graph, uh, the thickness of the clouds, and you know the rainfall. So there's a lot of you know uh, implicit uh, uh, meaning embedded in this you know text that you wouldn't be able to capture if you just like, were uh, uh, matching uh, keyboards, hard matching keyboards. And uh, and and for that reason, uh, I guess you know. Uh, these vector search engines are a great tool for discovering, you know, your data sets in high dimensional uh, in these high, high dimensional spaces. And uh, they have they have their own shortcomings. They, many of them they don't they don't do any sort of uh, graph analytics. Uh, so uh, I have this table here that shows the complexity of the query that I'm running and you know uh, what I can do with, the, with each of these tools. I'm not saying you know one is better than the other one for this particular use case. Uh, uh, actually, you know, it works very well for us. And with that, thank you. Do you have any questions? Oh. No, you need the microphone, mate. Speak into the mic. So maybe more of a philosophical question here. If you get to a state where your embedding is good enough, do you really need a knowledge graph? Uh, so if you ever get to that state, uh, uh, one of, I mean, so 
again, uh, embeddings are my favorite, you know, tools to play with, and they're great. But uh, but when you have a graph, it, you are leveraging a lot of the you know human knowledge that's already been you know created. And uh, we actually currently we have a version of this uh, in 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 at, at just as implemented in our. Uh, interface that is just using the embedding. Embeddings are not that good, you know, yet. But at the same time, uh, you want to create all these semantic you know, connections on top of that. So uh, why just just rely on you know uh, on, the, on, on the embeddings? And the other thing is that the matter of explainability. Because once you have a graph, and when you return a data set, now you can say, okay, this is a graph. I, I'm recommending this data set to you because it was in this publication. It was connected to this other publication, and that's connected to your data set. But the embeddings is just you know, a black box, and you just match it. Uh, okay, so this is uh, follows on that question and uh, connects to the previous talk as well. Have you done any use cases on this? I mean, this is very this is very data driven sandbox stuff. Uh, but do you know if people actually gain knowledge from the knowledge graphs? I'm skeptical. I'm optimistic, but skeptical. So this is this, this use case is a search. So it's not a search of the knowledge graph. It's a data set search. So kind of this is hidden to the user, but. Uh, and this project is just like two, three months old, uh, so we haven't yet, you know, uh, uh, done any sort of, you know, uh, 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 analysis on that. So, uh. I can give you an example of that on my talk. Promise. This is more of a comment, but I was thinking the same thing. What you're saying about this connecting it back to usability. Um, but I want to say that I think we're missing out on the value of this. You're taking the burden off the searcher to make some decisions as well as to have a knowledge base in a certain area. And that's the benefit of the knowledge graph in these applications. The user doesn't have to be as much of a subject matter expert or gets help from the subject matter expert who has helped design the decisions that's leading to this suggested results. I do think usability testing and also user studies will help show that benefit. Um, but I just wanted to add that as I think I felt a little bit negative when there was actually a very strong positive here. All right, let's move on to the next talk. My name is Irina Gerasimov, and I work at Guest Disk, NASA Guest Disk. And my talk is about a building block of the talks, the subjects that you have heard before, my, before that. Its building block is uh, publications. How do we find the publications that are used in the applications? Uh, and how would we automatically find these publications instead of, you know, sifting through these thousands and thousands of papers and libraries? How do we find publications that use our data? And uh, this is a solution. What we've done here at Guest Disk, we searched the major sources of bibliographic data. And the sources are such as Web of Science, Scopus, Crossref, um, Google Scholar, and of course, Dataset. And we search these sources by the Dataset DOIs that uh, our data centers, the DOIs of the data sets that our data centers serve. And then we process the data and collect it tag the data with necessary tags and collect and, and place the data into uh, citation management system, which is free, has web interface and accessible to all. 
Here I would like to compare the sources in terms of usability and you know how, how easy to, to use the sources. And most of them have APIs, uh, except Web of Science. Unfortunately, NASA does not have access to Web of Science extended API. So we had to use user interface, which a little bit of cumbersome. Uh, in terms of document coverage, as you know, Scopus and Web of Science have collections of selected peer-reviewed documents and Crossref Index has everything that, you know, registered with Crossref. And Google Scholar, indifferent to all, has a variety of documents and when you search the Google Scholar for DOI, you get not only research papers, but a bunch of other stuff and web pages. And I mean, everybody in this room search Google Scholar. You know what it is. So how to navigate Google Scholar, right? That's, that's one of the uh, problems that we had to address. And in terms of bibliographic data, the uh, subscription-based uh, resources, of course, have a base of the best bibliographic data that you can sift through automatically and find research content that, that, that are there. And Google Scholar has close to none, right? Very, very, very hard to automatically process the results of, of, of Google Scholar. And this is the results. And before I talk about the results, so we processed the results that are in on the screen is that we processed the publications to retain only the ones that have DOIs because otherwise it's very hard to match and you know deal with duplicates so the publication have to have DOIs we limit our set uh, to journal articles preceding papers books, reports, theses, and we removed from considerations, preprints, and discussions, and reviews, and data sets, uh, because those would create uh, duplicate content. And what we searched, we searched 10,000 of DOIs of NASA data sets. And when I say it was this, it was this organization that govern a NASA Earth Science DAGs, so it's 10,000 registered data sets from NASA DAGs, data sets registered with data site. And uh, by mid-2022, I just ran my last search three weeks ago, we find 14,000 of unique publications. So this is automated process. I didn't sit and, you know, read the publications. It's, autom it's, all, it's totally automated. And we found that 20. 800 of DOI cited at least once, and all others are not cited with DOIs. And uh, the, on average, we have 1.4 data set citations per publication. And the graph shows that, yes, our, our data are being cited. By this end of this year, maybe what we'll have 5,000, 6,000 publications just for one year, which is very, very exciting. And we can just scoop these publications by searching all of these engines and using these publications for, for further applications. And this again, diagrams show how the how, how the, our results overlap. Like, what do we gain by searching these four sources of, of uh, bibliographic content? And it demonstrates that Google Scholar gives us the most number of unique publications. It gives us 22% of unique publications and Crossref compared to the rest gives us only 4%. So if you are searching, it's something to use decision. And I remember Ted mentioned data site, like there is data site and data site has a very straightforward interface. You either go there from web, uh, web, website or you query it through API, you have your data set DOI and you get the publications that are there. The problem is it has very tiny amount of publications. 
I, I've been talking to data site folks, uh, I believe a year ago, they got their content from Crossref. It can be populated by community. We as data providers can populate it. But the picture for today is that it only contains 13% of, of all publications that we found in, in, in our work. For 2022, surprisingly, we got a better picture. So it is 30%. So hopefully, hopefully we'll, you know, get, get data set, uh, data, data site as a valid um, source, as a, as a, not valid, it's a rich source of, of bibliographic, uh, you know, content for that uh, reference our data sets. And this is a heat map about co-citations of the data sets and the publications. Like we have 12 DACs and each DAC is responsible for one or several disciplines. And then we find papers that cite data sets from various DACs. There can be two, three, four DACs, the data sets from two, three or four DACs in the, cited in a single paper. So it is interesting to see how this data site, um, uh, how the DACs are cited in the papers. Why? Because when researchers use data sets from different DACs, they have to learn tools developed at each DAC. So that's, we are, here we are talking about interoperability. And these numbers tell us that data from different DACs are cited. And there are 167 papers are from LP DAC and RNL DAC, not just this, I made a mistake on this slide. And finally, it's just a demonstration. So we've, we've we, uh, collected our citations and we have our data set device. Now we can build a knowledge graph. It's easy to do. And the knowledge graph from Vinny's talk can be used in usage-based discovery. It can be used for search. It can be used for everything because once we have the solid relationship between data sets and research content, we can build upon it. We have, we have bibliographic metadata, we have abstracts, we have text, and we can work from, 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 from that. And this is just a summary. Uh, collected the, the citations. Citations are in repository. If you get a PDF of, of the slides, you can click and see the repository, and you can wander around, uh, check out the tags. I will be very happy to get feedback on it because we do want to improve it and that's it thank you thank you Irina. Uh, if you can ask your question online uh i guess that's me is that right why not uh I had a I had a question about um, the duplication of the publication. So, for instance, if you pulled something from Google Scholar and you pulled something from Data Site, and the metadata is much richer from Data Site than Google Scholar, is there any way to sort of compare the metadata that you're getting from these different sources and generate a more complete record by combining them somehow? Is that a thing that can happen? Yes, we discovered a wonderful tool for this. It's called a Zotero translator server. You set it on your computer. You take a Google Scholar returns you a URL. You feed the URL into Zotero translator. And Zotero translator translate your URL into very rich metadata. And once you have your DOI in that metadata, then you do comparison. If you cannot get DOI, well, we just dismiss the record. We, we, we can't afford duplicates and we can't afford having content that we don't know what the content is. And you can also do a search of Crossref for metadata and get a DOI from there. I got Rahul first, you're next. Uh, Irina, um, did I understand right? You have 21,000, um, you've manually curated 21,000 publications and mapped it to the DOIs. Is that correct? Okay, so it's the number of publications, 14,000. Oh, 14,000. 14 unique publications. That's really nice. I think it's a really good benchmark data set for uh, uh, further applications. Thanks.
Um, I had a question. Sure. Thanks, Doug. Um, Arena, really nice talk and nice work. Um, I was I was a little bit confused when you were talking about the small number of, of I have two questions of hits that you were getting from data site for publications. And I'm wondering what publication means in the context of data site, because data site is is mostly uh, data sets and and text. So were were you looking only and there's a lot of variation. We'll be talking about that on Thursday in repositories and the kinds of resources that they have in data site. So when you were you including data sets in the in the does the word publication include data set or is it just something like a, a yeah, it's, it's an excellent question, and of course, it needs a clarification. So, data site is an uh, official repository for the data sets. The other content can be registered with, with, with data site as well, but it, it, is, it is for data sets. So, when I say that I search research data site, it means that we search data site for, our, for DOIs for our data set. And a data, data site has infrastructure where uh, so each data set has referenced by fields. So if there is publications that reference those data set, those publications are associated in, with, with, with data sets uh, in, in that infrastructure. So we don't use, we don't search for publications. We search for the data sets. We get the data set and publications associated with the data set. As I understand, the data site gets this information from cross-ref event data. This is how it populates that information. So we don't search for just for publications. We search for data sets and publications associated, linked to those data sets. Oh, hi, Irina. Uh, Bhaskar Ramachandran. Uh, I'm from Stack. Uh, you'd mentioned uh, Web of Science. Now, Cladivit owns Web of Science, which is a billion dollar company. The question is, uh, how easy is it for you to access their stuff via APIs or otherwise, uh, considering they do throttle you know, your usage? The reason I ask is uh, we're trying to use their APIs for a small prototype, and I'm wondering uh, if you have some sort of lessons to share there, you know. You. Right, and I, I'm getting the slide on screen where I said, well, Web of Science has extended API. I contacted Web of Science, and they said, no, we are not sharing with you extended API. NASA does not have a proper account for extend, using extended API. API, but I think if you would have an access to extended API, that would be excellent. The way I've done this work is that our EOS just, uh, data sets that they have common prefix. So we just search web interface by common prefix, so we don't have to click a button for every of 10,000 data sets. When you search by common prefix, due to the fact that you get a very rich metadata, you can sift through automatically and get, give this, get the association. But maybe for small projects, they would agree to give you the access. All right, thank you, Karina. Thank you again. So our next presentation is online. So uh, Bob Downs is gonna do a talk, so. Yes, hi. Um, do you want me to show my slides? Yes, okay, I will share my screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing.
you should be a co-host now. So I think that okay. Cool. Yeah, that looks like it's working now. Thank you. Super. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, exploring quote citations of CDAC data with uh, remote sensing data. And I'm glad to be following Arena's talk uh, where she talked about uh, post citations and uh, how we have the overlap amongst the, the different DACs there, which is quite fantastic. Um, when we uh, look at uh, data citations on the right here, which we, Chen et al. had come up with uh, a, a taxonomy of data citations, which talks about how uh, citations might be uh, used or not used or how they might be used uh, uh, in, in a publication. And when we have co-citation, uh, there are similar aspects to that. That is, there could be an evidence of a relationship between two data products that are cited together, but it uh, may or may not uh, be reporting on uh, using both uh, products. But there is value in using uh, CDAC data with remote sensing data, and co-citations give us some evidence of that, and shows new kinds of analyses, questions being asked, uh, new hypotheses, new methodologies, and ways to compare or verify corroborate uh, data or uh, complement studies or even to leverage our investments. So what we're looking at here now is uh, 25 years of, um, of uh, citations of CDAC data. And these are the percentage of the total CDAC data citations that also cite uh, remote sensing data here. And uh, here you have a different picture of the same thing where we can see that um, both are growing over the years. Uh, and um, now we can take a look at the, the journals um, uh, that uh, are, are uh, co-citing data. And if you look on the far left, you see that uh, lots of journals are co-citing CDEC data with other data just one to five times. And you look on the far right here at the bottom and only two journals um, uh, have uh, uh, co-cited CDAC data with uh, uh, remote sensing data uh, twice. And on the green, you see uh, these two journals are remote sensing and remote sensing of the environment. These are the top 10 journals in green that have been uh, co-citing CDAC data with remote sensing data. So uh, we have uh, continued our analyses of uh, co-citations of uh, CDAC data with remote sensing data uh, to go with uh, 25 years now. And uh, we're building on the methodology developed, uh, we developed uh, almost a decade ago to do that. Basically, we're uh, relying on, on uh, Web of Science primarily uh, through the years when we've been doing this, Web of Science uh, didn't necessarily have uh, newer journals in it. I'm noticing now that Web of Science is starting to catch up, but uh, new journals are springing up fast. So <laughs> it's a never ending uh, chase there. Um, so what we're looking at here are the 15 major fields, or you, you could call them uh, 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 broader than disciplines. Um, um, uh, and th these are um, uh, the fields represented by uh, the journals that are co-citing uh, CDAC data with remote sensing data. And as you would expect, you know, we're seeing environment and ecology and geosciences very well represented there. Uh, but what's interesting is, uh, you know, we, we have the social sciences in here and the multidisciplinary and a lot of other fields such as uh, microbiology and engineering and economics and business and biology, biochemistry, et cetera, represented. We can also look at a more detailed look here where we're looking at the, the web of science categories. These are narrower than the major fields. And, 
uh, 51 categories are actually represented within these journals. And uh, just those with 1% or more are shown here in the graph because it's, um, it gets a little busy. In fact, it's a little busy already, right? Um, but, uh, you know, uh, here, again, we can see environmental sciences and meteorology and ecology uh, and remote sensing uh, all, all represented uh, highly is expected, but we also see uh, you know, fields like biology and um, the uh, multidisciplinary sciences, parasitology, uh, et, et cetera, in, in here. So, and, and as well as uh, uh, public environmental and occupational health and planning and development, imaging sciences, et cetera. So uh, it gets a, a bit interesting as we start to look at all of these different uh, uh, um, uh, disciplines that are represented. Uh, and uh, the CDAC citations database is publicly accessible at this URL and people can look and do their own analyses or if they're interested in a particular data product, you can see how that data product is being cited uh, by uh, different journals and look whether it's actually being cited with remote sensing data and at different types, uh, as well as the years involved. And so with that, I wanna thank you all and uh, for your attention, as well as thanking CDAC staff for uh, all their work to get these data products out and Joe Schumacher, who uh, uh, puts together, he collects all our uh, data citations for us. Uh, thank you very much. Questions in the room? Right here. Hi, my name is Tilanka Munasingham from RPI. Actually, I want to say that thank you very much for sharing the CDAC data with I for my data analytics course with my students. We are using your data. This is not like a question. We wanted to say thank you and uh, because you keep up with the data sets updating and uh, students are using it. And uh, I think I can take some questions offline to you and share some insights, maybe without taking too much time. Uh, yeah, so thanks again one, uh, for sharing the data sets. The students, every semester they're using it. Thank you very much yeah. for sharing that with us. That's great. Oh, that's good, thank you, okay. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, are any more questions in the room before we go to the last presentation? Um, up in the front, Vinny. And then we're, hopefully we'll have some time left at the end to open it up to discussion. Hey, uh, this is Vinny. Um, I'm just curious, uh, what value do you derive internally uh, at CDAC from um, sort of the analyses that you have just shown? Um, is there anything surprising that you guys have learned that you're trying to sort of uh, leverage internally from that information? Uh, yes, um, it, it, it shows that uh, we really need to uh, provide a, a, a diverse array of tools uh, because uh, uh, our, our users aren't just representing, you know, the environmental sciences, if you will. And uh, there are a variety of users out there coming from various disciplines. And in order to enable them to use the data, we have to keep an eye on the kinds of tools that they might uh, want to use and provide the services for them and the data in format so that they could uh, use these data uh, within their own disciplines and across disciplines as, as, as teams begin to collaborate uh, in transdisciplinary ways. Oh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Anything online? Go ahead, Ken. Ed, you're muted. Oh, Ted. I thought you said Ken. Ted, get off mute. <laughs> Ken, I'll be polite to, but Ted. <laughs> Oh, 
We can't hear you, Dan. Well, uh, I think maybe Nobody we should move head. on. <laughs> There'll be time for discussion afterwards. So, uh, Doug yeah. Newman, take it away. This is the uh, opening for the discussion and the topic of um, this session, Federated Knowledge Graphs. So, hello, everyone. My name is Doug Newman. I'm at NASA ESDIS, and I stupidly suggested to Rahul that he asked an easy question, so I'm now throwing myself at his mercy. And you can ask a really difficult one after this, okay? <laughs> so, uh, you've just seen several uh, examples of how we've been uh, leveraging uh, knowledge uh, graphs and some uh, indications that uh, the ability to link different graphs together, a federated, if you will, solution to graphs, um, may allow us to go further. So what I'm going to talk about here is um, a possible solution to that problem. It's something that hasn't been um, investigated a lot, so this is quite an open-ended uh, talk on this. So I'm really interested to hear what your opinions on this are at the end, or during, if you want to heckle me. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the initial problem statement, some use cases, and some possible solutions. So uh, the problem statement, um, within OS, EOSDIS, we've achieved a level of success in extracting new knowledge from existing knowledge, as you were alluding to earlier, uh, utilizing uh, graph databases. Uh, use case, uh, um, I got a thing that says stop sharing, so I thought I was sharing. So I'm going to reshare with my entire screen then, see if that helps it. My apologies. And now I've got two screens. Um, how's that? Hallelujah. Sorry about that. Um, so a use case um, that I'm going to detail in the upcoming slides uh, shows um, how this could be a um, advantageous to us. Um, we know that there are other knowledge graphs and similar domains that can improve our implementation, but that knowledge resides in two separate graphs, operate in two different environments under different stewardship. So how can we combine and leverage that knowledge programmatically and efficiently? All right, now my slides aren't moving forward. What have we done? Okay, good. So Earth Data Search um, allows us to uh, get recommendations based on a certain data set we select. So if we select data set X is of interest to us, what other data sets might be uh, of interest? The existing knowledge represented by collection metadata in CMR was repurposed in a graph to extract new information in the form of similar collections based on shared artifacts, such as documentation. This facilitated a recommendation engine currently being leveraged in FDA search today. Uh, ESIP's usage-based discovery graph contains knowledge about articles and their relations to data sets. If two data sets shared an article, then they might be similar. Querying both graphs would hopefully allow us to improve the accuracy of our recommendations. But how do we do that? So if you've ever heard of me talk about graph before in any context at a conference, just in the corridor, I am fascinated by graph traversal. It's the greatest thing ever. So indulge me. So this is the representation of CMR's knowledge graph divide from collection metadata. So we, in the green, we've got various collections that we have, and then we have documentation, URLs, data center URLs, information about uh, instruments and platforms, projects, and they're all connected. And if we take that uh, collection in the middle, collection one, we can see that it shares documentation with collections four, two, and three. That was my light bulb moment when I was looking through the basic implementation and population of our graph. So what I was really trying to get to was linking collections to uh, articles, because I knew that if a collect two collections were mentioned in an article, as you've seen in numerous talks before me, then they're probably related in some way and can be useful. But we didn't have that um, uh, article information in the CMR. 
but I noticed that some articles reference the documentation of that collection. So I was looking at documentation as a stepping stone to get the linkage between the collections that I needed. But then I realized that those collections shared that documentation anyway. So they were related, but due to that fact, so I could build a recommendation engine purely based on that. And I thought that if somebody like myself who has no real domain knowledge in the science, I'm just an engineer who knows about metadata and how to store it and how to distribute it, could make that connection, then if I expose this information in the form of a graph to people who really know what they're doing, they could do a lot more than I do and extract a lot more knowledge, new knowledge out of this graph than the knowledge that was already inherent in it from the collection metadata. So that's what got me excited. But as you can see from CMR, um, there are limits to what we can do here. If you think of this as uh, an archipelago, I can explore by navigating down these, uh, these paths, but I get to collection five and all I can see is ocean. What do I do then? UBD has a similar graph associated with it. It's also uh, oriented around data sets or collections. And um, it links together various usages in the form of articles or applications, of like another archipelago of islands, all right? But they share some characteristics. They share the concept of data sets. So why don't we put them together? Bring CMR in and you get to um, um, the edges of CMR and you can go to UBD because uh, collection one is represented by a digital object or uh, identifier and so is data set five in UBD. So we can traverse between these graphs based on that knowledge alone. So in this particular case, um, this reinforces the strength of the similarity between collection one and collection three, because not only are they linked by a document documentation URL, they're also li linked by this, uh, this research paper in usage one. So when I uh, gave this uh, a dry run of this talk to my peers, they cried foul, and quite rightly so, because um, what if this research paper is the same as the documentation URL? And this is one of the caveats involved here. Am I f uh, artificially boosting this relationship by double dipping here? So this is a, one of the things we've got to be careful with as well. It's possible that that documentation URL one is actually the same thing as usage one, an application or scientific research paper. So that's one of the pitfalls of this. But I think you, I, hopefully you can see the utility of this by like, uh, being able to navigate across these archipelagos of knowledge. I just come up with archipelagos now. I'm going to stick with it. Um, so how do we do that? Um, should uh, CMR harvest the data in UBD and make a big Uber graph, or should we take a different approach? Now, ESIP have tackled this problem before with respect to data discovery and recognize the value of the main specific repositories with respect to data stewardship. The individual graphs will be more resilient if they remain in the hands of the original stewards. And given this, we proposed, like we did with this data discovery, a federated approach to knowledge graph extraction across domains. Also, we want to do a federated approach. It would be useful to embrace standards, which is something ESIP loves as well as me. Um, if we're all speaking the same language, then that federated case becomes more possible. So adopting standards in graph implementation is going to, uh, implementation is going to increase the probability of successful integration. So for query traversal at the moment, there are three widely used standards. Gremlin, which is my personal favorite, uh, Sparkle, and Cypher, which comes from Neo4j, which is, uh, they are intensely lobbying to become the uh, graph uh, query language uh, uh, standard at the moment. So how can we do this? Uh, we could tackle this by explicit language uh, linkage and traversal. This is where uh, a client is aware that their queries are required to interact with more than one graph. 
that they know where those graphs are and what aspects of those graphs link the two together. You saw from my previous collection data set example, uh, a user would need to know that collections and data sets are the same. That would be inferred by the fact that they're referenced by DOIs uh, and that some of those DOIs match up. Uh, but this puts a burden on the client and makes it, but it does make for a much easier solution. So both Sparkle and Neo for J, uh, and then by inference, uh, Cypher have um, the capability to do this, but Gremlin does not, which is really disappointing. Another way we could tackle this problem is for implicit linkage and traversal. Can we present a view to the client that abstracts the fact that graph boundaries are being crossed? The client doesn't need to know that there are other graphs, where the other graphs are. They don't need to know that a collection in CMR is the same as a data set in UBD. Now, I struggle with how, whether this is useful or not. I think it is, but I do know that it would be a lot of effort to uh, provide this and not entirely sure whether it's technically feasible. So um, there's a big question mark there. But if we could do such a thing, um, a possible implementation idea for implicit linkage and traversal, traversal would be something like this, where we would have linked data and virtual edges. So in CMR, we would have this uh, collection one, DOI one, and its counterpart in the UBD dataset 10, DOI one. So they're the same thing. So we would have the, what I'm referring to as a virtual edge described in both, both graphs, where that virtual edge is basically saying, at this location in the UBD, there's a collection that's exactly the same as this collection. And that's how you would do the linkage. And then for a client, I'm given a very simple Gremlin uh, example here. If they were just looking for all of the nodes uh, for each collection linked to documentation one, then part of their traversal abstracted away from them would take it across CMR into UBD and give them that usage five node, as well as documentation URL node in the CMR database. Now, there's a few caveats that I have in mind associated with all this. Um, the example when my peers called me and said, uh, you need to deduplicate your nodes across multiple graphs. True story. Um, there are going to be uh, examples where it's not uh, immediately obvious that a node in one graph is the same as a node in the other, but they need to be evaluated in order to make real uh, uh, truthful uh, knowledge extraction. And it's going to be difficult to keep those disparate instances of graphs in sync. CMR deletes a collection, UBD might not know about it until a period of time, and um, you're going to see uh, graph traversals break down because of that, unless we figure out how to do that. Um, we could do that by uh, lazy evaluation of queries, for example, where a query is executed and it discovers that a node no longer exists, doesn't return that in the result set, but at the same time kicks off some asynchronous job that says, get rid of this node, it's no longer there. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, I think for the implicit solution, there's a lot of heavy lifting involved. And I, I think we really need to determine whether the uh, ends justifies the means then. And that's my talk. Let's talk about it. Thank you, Doug. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll let you stand there and I'll deal with questions right. for you. So, um, do we have any online? Let's start there. No. And Let me have it, Rahul. Come on, what you got? <laughs> Is there someone from the room? There's Ken. Okay, well, here's Ken first. Yeah, thanks. Uh, fantastic topic here. Uh, Ken Casey from NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. Um, and just noting, we're building out a knowledge graph on underlying our new cloud archive, so we're super excited about the idea of being able to link that to other knowledge graphs. And I, I think I have a question. I'm wondering if there's anybody in the room from NSF and their open knowledge network effort, which I think is to do just this exact thing, to link together knowledge graphs across the community to you know, solve the world's problems like NSF likes to do. So I was just wondering if anybody maybe online or in the room can comment more on how that might connect. 
I see a lot of like, uh, talk about that in the abstract, but I don't see it being solved at a programmatic level. And that's the thrust of why I wanted to put this together. We need to solve that problem. It's all very well for somebody to, a human being to like manually look at these things and make these connections. But if we can automate that, um, back it up with APIs and standards, I think that's where we need to gain traction. I believe we had 10 minutes. Hey, Doug, can you hear me now? I can hear you, Ted. Great. Right nice to see you. Right. Um, nice to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> on this, this uh, deduplication thing that you were talking about, what is there a role in that for for DOIs? I, I, I sort of thought the DOIs were would be useful in that deduplication process. Am I am I missing something? No, I think you're right. Um, if we had a um, uh, if we were in a situation where things like uh, we had uniform uh, representation and articles, data sets. Uh, any of these concepts, if they all had a unique identifier, then um, yeah, that would be a very good solution to this problem. But, but doesn't as this control what I mean, which of their things have digital object identifiers? I mean, all their data sets and those documentation pieces could all be submitted to you know data site, for instance, for DOIs. I work for us this now, don't I? I think um, so. Yes, but we have control. We have a certain amount of uh, authority over making sure that collections have uh, DOIs, and we are strongly encouraging that. But online documentation, uh, readmes, GitHub repos associated with those, that's more difficult to uh, promote, I think. And we really would need it across all our concepts in order to successfully tackle this deduplication. I mean, it's certainly something we might need to like step up on, but at the moment we're just, we're trying to enforce that all collections or data sets, if you will, have DOIs and making a, a, a some, we have some degree of success there, but we'd have to broaden that scope to uh, solve that problem that way. Yeah. Well, it, you know, data site has a wide variety of resource sites that can that you can use to get DOI. So you might want to take a look at that. Yeah, I made a note of that the last when you mentioned that earlier. So yes, thank you for that. The, this uh, example was just one case of duplication, and there are lots of other kinds of duplication that can arise that don't have to do with documentation or publications or data sets. It could be projects. So now we have unique IDs for every project or programs or instruments and platforms that becomes a lot of overhead. Ruth, please. Okay, so my comment is, is related to, wouldn't it be easier to federate your graphs if, for example, the concepts in them all had unique identifiers, i.e. were part of a, like an ontology, um, as well as the individual instances of each, because then you wouldn't have nearly as much an issue with uh, trying to figure out if these two things are really the same or not. In other words, your deduplication problem, as well as a much easier ability to then, um, you know, determine if these two graphs actually are something that uh, could be joined somewhere. In other words, in an automated fashion, because they're sharing a concept which has, you know, which is in uh, some ontology, uh, which has a real definition. Agreed, Ruth. Yeah, maybe that's also a question for the room. So does anybody want to pick up on Ruth's point? Have any thoughts? The uh, other speakers, perhaps. Here it comes. I'll, I'll come to you next. Sorry, I think just I think I tend to be on the other side of this discussion. 
because we've tried to build ontologies for so long. You know, scaling up has always been a hard thing to do. Getting consensus has been a hard thing to do. I think maybe there's more value for us if you're looking at production system to look at more data-driven approaches that we can build and scale out. This is just my opinion. We have someone waiting with a question, but we can revisit Ruth's. Oh, I was just gonna comment that um, actual, actually there are a lot of applications just not at NASA. Um, but, well, actually that's not even true because in the biology world and the medical world, um, this has been very successful and used all over the place. Um, but um, the whole issue of requiring consensus is a non-starter because actually you don't require consensus. You require exact definitions. That's, that's what's required. It's fine if two fields disagree, then you end up with possibly two terms. The classic example is thermokarst, which is either a, a process or a landform, depending on what community you came from. And that's fine. In the ontology, there are two terms, thermokarst process and thermokarst landform, and you just pick the one you want. Um, so yeah, um, just so I guess, Rahul, I'm saying I choose to disagree. All right, I'm going to uh, change the topic a little bit. <laughs> Um, so going back to uh, use cases, sorry, that, um, those online, I'm Valerie Dixon, I'm NASA ESDIS, I am in the Earth Data Search and CMR wheelhouse, um, and office mates with Doug, but to talk about um, building use cases and trying to find the community source for this, um, living within the niche that I reside in, you know, I think of, okay, how can we do this in Earth Data Search, how can we build on this? You know, would we do a smart handoff to a more transparent like graph traversal of like, hey, here's your search results, here's the related, you know, collections based on, you know, data citations, do you want to explore further based on collection DOI, citation DOI, do you want to explore further on NOAA graph or this other graph via this other tool, um, and, and give the user sort of those options to do further discovery, I don't know if that would get any traction. Um, I don't know necessarily what the best community use cases would be. And I do kind of want to open it up to ESIP to say you, you guys are big users <laughs> of our products. What would you like to see? How would you like to discover this data? How can we better or best marry these these graphs to help get usable information and, and more useful information for you? I think the scope in the co-location of data problem uh, where graph can help um, finding data sets that are appropriate for co-location for example can be helped it can we can help there um, expanding the scope of the um, graphs we're using to do that can only help that um, the example i used uh, within the uh, bounds of cmr's graph we can tell you about related collections based on shared documentation. That's usually a good indicator of co-location uh, capability of data. But um, articles that actually did co-locate co different data sets, an even stronger case, that's all in UBD right now. So being able to leverage both of those to boost rankings on recommendations, I think is, is a winner. I also think that um, there's, an a there's an aspect of if you build it, they will come to uh, exposing graph uh, query uh, patterns to um, a variety of users. Um, just keeping that information locked in the engineers who are designing CMR, for example, is only going to get you so far. As I mentioned earlier, I made the connection of like shared documentation equals similar data sets because it's a bit of a no-brainer, but I'm sure there are much more subtle relationships that other expertise can uh, uh, reveal that uh, the engineers in that domain might miss. 
So that's why I think it's a very good case for opening this up to everybody else, even though we don't necessarily have a use case for them yet, they might find one. It's, it's an engineering problem, but the issues Ruth brings up, it's also a subject matter expertise problem. Mm -hmm. And you know we don't have unicorns in this room, so we have to all kind of work together and uh, bring our different perspectives. So um, I think we just have a little more time. Are there any other thoughts or observations? Yeah. Uh, Jeff Campbell with the National Agricultural Library. If I look at this from sort of a information science perspective, the one thing that I haven't heard about is the quality of the results. So somebody said, oh yes, and we got all these other links from Google. Well, are they really relevant? And if they're not relevant, you're just overwhelming the person with junk. Um, you know, I've tried any number of Google searches recently which just, just give me everything off topic. Uh, you know, and you get stuck with keywords that have different meanings and different settings. And, you know, the classic example is Polish and Polish and, you know, things go on from there, okay? Uh, could these techniques create better keywords, which would fit better into some of the other currently existing categories? Um, you know, that seems to be another way of, of looking at it. You know, would more keywords be helpful? Well, they're only helpful if it's the keyword I'm look, I want to be searching for. Um, yeah. Any thoughts? <laughs> in other words, uh, summarize the world in two sentences. It is difficult to measure how uh, useful this uh, derived knowledge is. And the only ways I can think to measure that are <laughs> um, whether the uh, surfacing of that information and the tools that we have uh, leads to uh, um, a success in terms of uh, leveraging that data to produce new science. That's really difficult to measure. The uh Classic measurement of it has been precision and recall. So recall being what percentage of all the possible things out there did you get? In other words, what was missed? And um, the other is what percentage of the things that you got are really relevant? Right. I mean, and those are the- That that's would involve the, a close interaction with your users. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of a more, um, hands-off way of measuring it, sure. Yeah. Well, it's also a, a test data, you know, you, you don't go for all, but if you know what you have in the uh, repository or catalog, you might be able to get something in those directions. I think, anyway. uh, Valerie, for example, with uh, the recommendation for introverse data search, I don't think we have anything in terms of measuring how successful those recommendations are yet, right? That might be something we should really look into. <laughs> Any other questions? You could. Well, I, I'd like to say something more because there, this uh, session had a very interesting title, The oh. Human Atlas, and part of that was to explicitly bring in the mapping as aspect and that's not part of this work yet but i'd like to explore bringing in um, you know geospatial into into this uh, usage-based discovery uh, the other part is the human and really the human dimension and uh, reaching out to other communities uh, maybe uh, traditional knowledge non-scientific uh, sources of information this is really a bridge a bridging tool to reach out to um, outside of the earth sciences and, and bringing in those communities. So uh, just some, some things to think about. And uh, there's a lot of fodder here. So I hope you'll come and join us on the discovery cluster as we continue to march down this road. 
We have a prototype application that uh, NASA is stewarding that we can continue to develop and help Vinny with uh, making it more usable and testing it. We have uh, technology that um, Doug Newman is uh, innovating on in uh, federating knowledge graphs. Uh, we have a, a large user community here in ESIP who can benefit from these developments in NASA. And I heard that NOAA is doing something similar with knowledge graphs that maybe between uh, these large organizations, we can come up with shared standards and approaches so that they can eventually meet up at the end and be federated. So join us by subscribing to our mailing list if you are interested. Our meetings are when? It's uh, the third or fourth Thursday at 3 p.m. Okay. Um, we'll hope to see you. Thank you very much, everybody, for talking. Appreciate it. Thanks, Doug.